Well, good afternoon, and well, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. And I hope you had a lot of coffee <laughs> to attend these two lectures because it's two hours, but in fact, these are two different lectures. Uh, one is on uncertain quantification, that's the first hour, and there is a break, and the second hour is about uh, multi objective optimal control. Um, these two lectures are not really on dynamics or on orbits, uh, but I hope they are useful to you because they provide some tools that you can use if you then do orbital uh, mechanics. Okay? And especially given that the school is on space missions in general, uh, some of these tools can be used to design space missions. Um, the first talk mm -hmm. is actually also um, so I was asked also to uh, give you an overview of some job opportunities that are connected to uh, this um, European uh, Marie Curie uh, network and also to other things that are happening at the University of Strasbourg. So first of all, uh, within Utopia, that is a Marie Curie network that I'm running at the moment that started this year, uh, we are still in the process of recruiting people and we managed to recruit most of the fellows but there are still some opportunities uh, the network is based on uh, numerical methods for uncertainty quantification and optimization. So in the network we have a lot of universities and research centers within Europe that are mainly doing applied math and um, engineering. And we have an open position here at the University of Durham in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. And the um, position is a Marie Curie Fellowship uh, that can be used to do a PhD. Uh, the position is on imprecise probabilities applied to the treatment of large scale uh, measurements or data uh, connected to dynamic processes. It is quite theoretical. Uh, I, I have to admit that we went through already a lot of applications, uh, but uh, this position remains still open. The other two opportunities that uh, I would like to highlight, we have a position on artificial intelligence connected to space mission design. If you're interested, and if you have any background in computer science or artificial intelligence, we are looking for a PhD uh, at the University of Strathclyde. And still at Strathclyde, we have open positions, about 20 open positions, from lecturer up to professor, and in different fields, not necessarily engineering, not necessarily space. Uh, they go from physics to uh, uh, social science. Uh, but if you are interested in any of these things, I will be here also next week. So come and talk to me. All right, so after the fun stuff, Let's start with the actual lecture. So the first lecture will be on uncertainty quantification. Um, and this is the point of view not really of someone who does orbital mechanics, but it's the point of view of someone who does numerical methods and has to develop something to deal with uncertainty in general. So I will start by giving you some definitions about what uncertainty quantification is. And if you are familiar with statistics and probabilities, you might find that uh, some of the things I say are a little bit odd. Um, then I will uh, tell you more about which type of uncertainty we are interested in, in general, and then some of the methods that can be used to quantify uncertainty. And if there is enough time in the first hour, I will also tell you something about modern uncertainty that is the trickiest type of uncertainty uh, to capture, especially in dynamical systems. So what is uncertainty quantification? Um, 
You have different ways of quantifying certainty. So suppose that you, this is your dynamic uh, system, your, that you have a model for it, and you have some parameters that are not deterministic. Okay? So a direct problem is to propagate basically this uh, probabilistic uh, variable or stochastic variable to your system model and then calculate whatever quantity of interest uh, is on the other side, okay? Which could be, for example, you have your initial conditions that are not fully deterministic because they come from measurements, for example, and you want to uh, have a quantification of the uncertainty associated to the final conditions. So there is a, a propagation uh, problem here, how to go from this point to this point, and the other problem is which kind of uh, probabilistic model you're using to represent your uh, uncertainty in the initial conditions. Now, once you are on this side, you can reconstruct a probability distribution function or a commodity distribution function, and then work on this uh, um, distributions. The other problem that is common, and you have it, for example, when uh, you have a lot of observations, and you try to infer some parameters that are missing in uh, uh, your model from observations, typically when you observe uh, uh, asteroids and you want to get something out of uh, uh, the tracklets or something like this, you start in the opposite direction. So you have a uh, measurement of your state with a probability model that in a way depends on your measurement and your instrument, so whatever your, your sensor, whatever you're using, and you try to reconstruct, still using a model, you try to reconstruct something that you don't know, which are, for example, the non-observable state. And then there is another uh, uh, sort of uh, class of uncertainty, which is quite tricky because is the uncertainty that is uh, often called structural, in which you're missing part of the model. So if you try to do the inverse problem or the direct problem, you, you still are missing something. So whatever you're propagating through your system model uh, doesn't really work that well because you're missing part of your dynamics. And there are ways, of course, to do it uh, in a classical way. Uh, so uh, often when you look at the community that does uh, stochastic uh, processes, they consider everything that is unmodeled as a stochastic process. So just as noise that you try to uh, capture somehow. Unfortunately, that doesn't always work, and, and there are several reasons for that. So in orbital mechanics, uh, the problem is that you have generally a, a differential equation and that you have some stochastic variables, some state variables, some parts of your model that are unknown, like these two functions, h and g, and then you have your initial condition that is typically something that you might or not know completely. So this is something that can be expensive. Expensive in the sense that running simulations and getting information about the uh, final state can be quite time consuming. And that's one of the uh, problems of uncertainty quantification. Um, so for the diet problem, what you want to do is to start from a model for your uncertainty in the parameters that are known or the stochastic variables or the functions that are missing in your model. And what you want to obtain, for example, in the case of a dynamic system, is the spatial distribution of your final state or the state at some point. And you might be interested in actually a history a long time of the evolution of the state. And, and yes, this is the other key point, you don't want just to have a distribution of your possible states, but also the probability associated to each one of the possible states that you have. And as I said, in the inverse problem, you have already a measurement or a, something that tells you what the state is at different times and you want to reconstruct basically uh, the, the parameters or the, the modern uncertainty in your dynamics. So in general, when you want to do UQ, 
And this is quite important because often there is a bit of confusion in this. You don't have only the propagation problem. A lot of people focus on how to propagate uncertainty to a dynamic model. But in fact, the overall cycle of uncertainty quantification includes the definition of a model for your uncertainty by using, for example, a Gaussian distribution or something else. And then once you propagate your um, uncertainty to the model, you want to do something with it, which is normally called conditioning or inference process. And if you are familiar with uh, state estimation using Kalman filtering, for example, in Kalman filtering, you have all these three things together. Okay? You have an assumption on your uncertainty in the initial state. You have a way to propagate the uncertainty to your dynamic model, which is often linear. So you linearize your dynamics. And then you receive some measurements, and then you combine the propagated state with the measurement, and you have an inference process which is uh, based on the Bayesian theory to then come up with a prediction of the next uh, state. Okay, so let's see which type of uncertainties we are uh, concerned about. So the first thing is important to distinguish between what is normally known as aleatory uncertainty and epistemic uncertainty. And generally, in celestial mechanics, most of the people are fairly familiar with aleatory uncertainty, because that is what comes from measurements. Okay? And measurements, <coughs> generally, are assumed to be very well characterized. So you know your sensor, and you know, and you have a full statistics on your sensor. So you know the bias, you know uh, the, the linearity of your transfer function, so you know pretty much everything about that. Uh, so this is uh, an intrinsic property of a system and is not something that you can reduce or eliminate by knowing more about the system. Okay? So again, if I take the example of the measurement, it doesn't matter how many times you measure something, you still have this error in your measurement. Epistemic uncertainties are a little bit different because they are related to the level of knowledge that you have on the system. And they are not necessarily something that you can measure. Now, actually, typically, epistemic uncertainty are not measurable in the classical sense, so you cannot use a so-called frequentist approach, in which you measure, you simulate, you use Monte Carlo, and then you get your probability distribution. You don't have this in, in the general case. And often, uh, these epistemic uncertainties are related to human knowledge and to subjective probabilities, okay? Which, again, is something that happens if you go to a conference and you have different theories, uh, and then you have to decide which theory is the correct one, okay? So you ask to some experts, they say, no, my theory is correct because this is this, but in their theory, they always have something that is not fully known, okay? So if you have to do inference on this, then you uh, fall under epistemic uncertainty. Now, <coughs> is this something that uh, really matters when you come to the uh, definition of the uncertainty in your, for example, final state? Well, one might say, okay, I don't care about uh, what I don't know, and everything I don't know, I model with a uniform distribution, which is typical way of dealing with something that you don't know. But in fact, what happens if you use this kind of approach is that you inject, basically, in your process a lot of knowledge. Because what you're saying is that if this is the stochastic variable, and this is the cumulative distribution function of the stochastic variable, you are simply saying that your probability of an event is just growing linear, which is quite a strong assumption. So it's not really true that you're not, uh, that you're assuming that you don't know anything. You're actually saying quite a lot about your stochastic variable. In fact, if you had a stochastic variable that was modeled with a family of distributions that you don't know at all, in this case, for example, you can take a beta distribution that is defined on a finite set, what happens is that your probability is confined between an upper probability and a lower probability. Okay? And this gap 
is actually what you don't know. So it's the epistemic uncertainty on the, the, the stochastic process. <coughs> it's, it's what you don't know in this case. So what is a realistic example? Well, say that you have, again, a, a sensor and you try to characterize the sensor, but you have very few and sparse measurements of your sensor or how your sensor is reacting to something. So this means that you can fit basically your measurements with more than one model. Okay? And this means that, in theory, if you don't know anything more about how the response of the sensor is, what you can do is just to say that the uh, output of your measurement is within a certain interval of probability. Okay? So you don't have a nice Gaussian distribution with a mean uh, and a standard deviation. It's like having multiple uh, Gaussian distributions or other distribution all uh, mixed together. And if you cannot even talk about a family, the only thing that you can do is to say, well, I have a, an uncertainty space, which is a probabilistic uh, space, and I have a subset of the space, and for each one of the possible subsets, I just take the worst and the best possible outcome of uh, my measurements. Okay? And in this case, the probability of having a particular measurement is confined in this outer curve, okay? which is showing you that you have even less knowledge about your uh, um, sensor because for a given value of the measurement, that, that value can be true or false as a probability one. So you, it's like saying that you don't know if the measurement is correct. Okay, now coming back to the general classification, um, as I said, there are structural uncertainty that are also called modern uncertainty that depends on how well you know the dynamics of your body, for example. And these are very difficult to capture because you, you don't actually know how to write the equations. Okay? So one part of the equations is missing. Uh, experimental uncertainty is fairly well known. They are aleatory in nature, and you can characterize them with very precise distributions. The same geometric uncertainty, typically the size of something. If you have enough measurements, then you get a probability distribution on that size. Uh, you <coughs> often have a good knowledge also of parameter uncertainty. Uh, say that in your dynamical system there are uh, parameters that define the dynamics uh, and again if you have enough measurements of those physical parameters then you have a distribution of those parameters but in some cases you have, don't have enough information okay? you just have theories about the value of those parameters in that case you fall under epistemic uncertainty and then there are the two uh, types of uncertainty that typically you have when you try to work with numerical methods one is so-called algorithmic uncertainty. And there was a question this morning about what you do with a symplectic integrator. How can you be sure that the outcome of that integration is correct? Okay? So that is something that you can model in some cases. In some other cases, you, you do not have a full theory of that integrator that can tell you exactly what, you, what the error is in the end. And of course, the last one is human uncertainty, which is normally called subjective uncertainty and is typically related to gambling. Okay? When someone is betting on the fact that whatever he or she say is true. Okay? So if you are a very confident person, you can convince people that what you are saying is true, but maybe that's not the case. So there is a whole theory just about this, how to manage people uncertainty. I'm not going to explain this. So, uh, I just want to show you an example of how potentially deal with uh, uh, epistemic uncertainty. Uh, epistemic uncertainty often is referred to as imprecise uh, uncertainty or imprecision in your probability. And it's typically the case when you don't have the probability distribution or you are unsure about the probability distribution that you're using. Yeah? So, how, how do you propagate this, and, and what you do, what, what, what 
comes out of this other side. Okay? It is, it's very strange how to model this. So there is a theory um, that is called evidence that essentially say that you have enough pieces of evidence that mathematically are um, <coughs> set, this theta, and this is the uncertain variable. What happens is that if you have no knowledge of the probability distribution, essentially each one of these sets maps into a set of possible probabilities. Okay? So this is called a multivariate mapping between a, piece, a set of pieces of evidence that, for example, uh, a particular value of the parameter of dynamic model is correct, and all the possible outcomes of your simulation with your dynamic model. So this means that you go from crisp numbers now to sets. And you stop working with the real number, everything now mm -hmm. looks like a, a set with a finite or infinite size. So as an example, so say that I have uh, this underlying process and I want to know if uh, this process is below or above a certain threshold. Say for example that you want to know if you are impacting with an object or not. Okay? So if you are below here, you're impacting. If you're above this, you're not impacting. But you don't have an exact probability distribution for your initial conditions. You can only guess that your initial conditions are within some intervals here. And for each one of these intervals, you assign a subjective probability. So you think that you are within this, this, or that. OK, so what happens is that <coughs> At this point, you cannot have a complete uh, probability of your impact. You can only say if you are within a certain range of probabilities. Okay? So the lower estimation of your possible impact probability, in this case, contains all pieces of evidence that are for sure below the threshold. In this case, the only piece of evidence is this one because the process is completely below the threshold. So my lower estimation, my most conservative estimation that I have an impact is 0, 0,5. The upper estimation instead has up all the pieces of evidence that in a way support the fact that you can have an impact. And in fact, if you look at this interval, some possible values give me a process that corresponds to an impact because I have no detraction, while here I do not have any input. Okay? So, in a way, the upper probability is optimistic, the lower probability is pessimistic, depending on how you see it, and because of an input probably that way around. But uh, in this case, I have an unknown, which is whether I should take the lower bound or the upper bound on the probability of an input. And the only way to refine that estimation is to know exactly the probability distribution within these intervals okay? that I don't have at the moment. OK, so one way to deal with epistemic uncertainty in this case is to take a set of intervals, propagate this to the model, and get a set of possible outcomes. Okay? So I'm mapping a set into another set. Now, this is the case of the estimation, in fact, of the mass of the spacecraft. It's not really an example related to uh, uh, system mechanics, it's work that I had to do for ESA to design spacecraft in a different way. So if this is the estimated mass of, of a spacecraft, you have an uncertainty here that corresponds to the margin that you have in the possible mass of the spacecraft at the end of the design process. And this is how much you don't know about all the parameters in your system design that are probabilistic. Okay? Um, so this is the most conservative estimation of the mass of the spacecraft. And this is the most optimistic uh, estimation of the mass of the spacecraft. Because as you can see, 
here I can say that I can have a three kilogram space covering probability that is almost one. Okay? But if I was more conservative, I should say the probability that I have actually that space cap at the end of the design process is only 10%. Okay, so uh, I hope I, I managed to convince you that there are different types of uncertainty and some are very not intuitive. Now, let me show you some methods to deal with all this uncertainty. Now, first of all, if you're not in celestial mechanics, but if you are dealing with uncertainty in other fields, normally you hear talking about two classes of methods. One are so-called intrusive methods, and the other one is non-intrusive methods. And the major difference is that in the case of intrusive methods, you need to have access to your model, which is something that people doing dynamics normally have, because you, you work with equations. So you have direct access to your model. So you can do all sorts of things. You can do expansions, you can do Taylor, you can do whatever you, you, you like. But people that typically work in industry, or if you talk with a company that has a simulation model, that maybe you wrote, that is proprietary, cannot really look inside the box, cannot open the software, so they need to have a method that allows them to do predictions without manipulating the equations. And this is the class of non-intrusive methods. Just a, a, a short list, Monte Carlo sampling is of course not intrusive because you just need to run simulation. Uh, if you use common filtering, you have uncertain transformation. Uh, recently, within the space community, polynomial chaos expansions have become popular, and Gaussian mixture as well. Um, we work with the high dimensional model representations or Chebyshev interpolation. All these methods are based on the fact that you can run simulations. Okay? So you can run a propagation of your model and you can uh, uh, calculate your states at a certain point in time. Intrusive methods, as I said, need to have access to the model and are probably the one that are favorites to the dynamics community because you manipulate equations so you can do Taylor expansions. So typically a state transition method. Okay? So you, you calculate the expansion to the first order and then you propagate the state transition matrix. Uh, Professor Shears worked a lot on state transition tensors, so I extended basically that from order one to, I think, you visually three, four. Um, or you can have uh, other methods based on polynomial chaos expansions, but intrusive. And another thing that has become popular recently is to use uh, an algebra and replace the crisp number algebra and put, it that, uh, put in place of that a polynomial algebra. Okay? So you, you do calculations with polynomials instead of doing calculations with real numbers. And what we did in Glasgow, and I have a talk on Monday about this, we generalized basically the idea of Taylor expansions and I will explain why in a sec. Now, why are people so concerned about doing all these expansions, all these methods. But the reason is that if you just do the state transition matrix, you're normally assuming that your process is linear. Okay? Or at least within the measurement interval, both the measurements and the dynamics behave linearly. And typically, what you see is that the outcome is an ellipsoid and that ellipsoid has a mean value. So the only two parameters that you need are mean and values. Okay? Now, if that is not the case, because, for example, your uncertainty is much bigger than the one that you can describe in ellipsoid and a covariance matrix, then you fall in the case of a nonlinear propagation, okay? and you need an unfair method. Although someone uh, in the half of the 90s said, okay, if you use, for example, Cartesian coordinates, you see no linearities that are much stronger because you have huge variations of your Cartesian parameters. But if you reparameterize your problem, and for example, use orbital elements, then you can still use, for example, the state transition matrix. Okay? Because your orbital elements change much slower. And uh, you don't really need to go for a higher order method or a very complicated expansion. 
Now, this is perfectly valid, is correct. Of course, you need to assume that you have your orbital elements, so in some cases, do not actually apply that well. It was also demonstrated that they work over a certain range of times of propagation, but it, it is certainly a very useful uh, thing to know. Now, the other thing I was mentioning is that you might want to have a probability distribution and you want also a spatial distribution of your outcomes. So this is the case that we studied some years ago about um, disposing a satellite from uh, L2 and trying to hit the moon. Okay? So you want to know what the probability is that you can actually hit the south pole, which is here. And so this half moon is the spatial distribution of all the samples that actually hit the moon, but the color code tells you the probability associated to each one of those samples. Okay? And as you can see, you have a low probability of hitting the moon here, you have a high probability of hitting the moon here. But the interesting thing is that your spatial distribution is definitely not an ellipsoid. But the other interesting thing is that you don't have a single Maxima of your uh, maximum of your probability, which means that the distribution is not fully model. So if you try to calculate the, the average or the mean, you probably get a point which is not the most likely event. Okay? So you need to look at um, other quantities that are, for example, the most probable um, outcome of your stochastic process. So this is a typical case in which your linear hypothesis doesn't work and you cannot even use, in this case, the reparameterization in orbital parameters because it's a, it's a four-body problem, in this case, uh, with real families. Uh, and then you have two different um, of, um, reference systems. And another thing that uh, has been done uh, in the past 20 years now, and not just in this community, is to say, okay, why don't we borrow something from statist statistical mechanics? For example, people who study galaxy dynamics take Boltzmann equation and use that instead of following each single star. Okay? So you have a partial differential equation and you can apply probability on top of it because Boltzmann equation is already a uh, um, based on probability. But other people said, okay, why don't we simplify Boltzmann equation that is a nightmare to solve? And for example, we just take the um, um, fusion component uh, with what is normally called the continuity equation. Okay? And in some cases, you drop also this, which is a source term that corresponds to collision. So, for example, you can use this to study uh, globally the dynamics of your space debris. And, of course, you need a special treatment if you start generating debris because of collision and fragmentation. Okay? Now, this kind of approach is quite interesting, it's global, but it's not really giving you a probability distribution associated to each one of the fragments, unless you put something on top of it. So, if you add a probability, as to which point in space. Now, going back to Monte Carlo, one thing that is quite interesting is this. So, it can be applied generally. Okay. Um, I, I do this and then maybe you can take a break. Okay. So, uh, Monte Carlo is applicable in general and if you follow the central limit theorem, it's telling you that if you have enough samples, basically what happens is that your expected value converges to something and that also your variance converges to something. This is perfectly uh, okay, but you need the hypothesis there that your final distribution is in fact unimodal. Okay? Is underneath this convergence because what you have out of this Monte Carlo process in the end is only two statistical moments the expected value and the bias. Okay? 
but your distribution might be, might be much more complicated than this. So you can use other methods, okay? So if you take the uncertain transformation, which is typically in common filtering, you can integrate and propagate your dynamics as in Monte Carlo, but using a reduced number of samples, okay? In this case, you use only two n with n, the dimension of your uh, state space. And generate some samples to your model, and then you combine this with your measurements, okay? So you propagate your samples to the measurement model and to the run. This is a very powerful tool, allows you to reduce the number of samples, but you need to have the hypothesis that you have a symmetric distribution here, okay? And again, that the only thing that you're interested in are the two statistical moments, expectation and values. Okay, let me skip this. So that's why people decide to go for polynomial cast expansions in a number of cases. So in this case, you take your uh, quantity of interest, that is maybe the state at a certain time, and you expand this in polynomial form, in which each one of these polynomials is orthogonal. Okay? And what you need to do is to determine these coefficients such that this r corresponds to the distribution of your state at the end time. Okay? Now, I don't want to go into this, but if you are able to determine this, uh, uh, determine this uh, um, coefficients, what you have is that the first coefficient is the expected value, the second coefficient is the variance, and then each coefficient thereon is a higher statistical moment. Okay? So you can model a fairly complicated distribution uh, by uh, calculating these coefficients, and you do it by generating samples. Okay? So you need to generate simulations of your problem. Uh, there are several schemes to do so. So this is an example again for the case of the impact to the moon that I showed before. So this is a full Monte Carlo simulation of the velocity of the spacecraft before impacting the moon. And this is what you can generate with a polynomial class expansion up to the base 6. Okay? This required a million samples, and this only 26,000 samples. Okay? So you, you still need to run your model a few times, but you can cut down quite substantially the number of simulations, and you get a distribution that becomes very similar, both in, in a, a probability and in shape, so in, in the shape of the distribution. Okay. Um, you can do the same with the Gaussian mixture, that is essentially a weighted sum of uh, Gaussian uh, kernels, and that allows you still through sampling to calculate the same probability distribution as for the uh, uh, polynomial class expansion. Uh, you can also use Kriegin models that are polynomial models based on, um, again, uh, Gaussian kernels. And you can use what we are using in, in Stratclyde. You can use a so-called high-dimensional model representation in which you develop basically your function, your quantity of interest, into a series which is similar to a Taylor series. But you don't actually calculate this through differentiation, but you generate basically this term through sampling. Okay? So you, you calculate uh, these terms by sampling properly uh, your, your uncertain value. <coughs> okay. So, maybe we stop here for five minutes, take a break, and then I finish with this, and then um, it is me. Okay. Great.
funziona, vada a rappresentare la funzione lavoro più lunga. Cioè, diciamo, la funzione f è decomponibile nella somma di funzioni e ognuna di queste funzioni deve essere... Qual è questa sfida? No, Allora, io dico, il finale io lo posso decomporre in una sommatoria di funzioni che è fatta in maniera particolare perché eh, questo è eh, il valore della funzione di un punto questo è in realtà un polinomio che contiene soltanto la variabile iesima questo è un polinomio che contiene la variabile iesima e diesima questo è un polinomio che contiene la variabile 1, 2, 3, 9 però sono variazioni le posso scrivere come variazioni o anche no. A questo punto, come faccio a costruirmi queste funzioni? Devo prendere uno di questi metodi e dire ognuno di queste f qui è rappresentato per esempio da questo, da questa espansione. Okay. Oppure posso usare questo, posso dire che ogni PLF è rappresentata dalla somma di queste kernel corsioni. A questo punto io devo campionare la F e andare a ricostruirmi per ognuno di queste F i coefficienti dei polinomi che sto usando per rappresentare una di queste F. Una cosa che mi... Questo è alternativo a qualcosa tipo un caso di questo in realtà serve perché se, per esempio, l'accoppiamento tra questa variabile e questa variabile è molto eh, debole, questa componente qui avrà un'influenza molto piccola sulla rappresentazione di questa variabile. Quindi io a un certo punto posso cominciare a eliminare il termine. Okay? E, eh, l'espansione si tronca a un livello tale per cui il numero di campioni e il numero di termini è basso, quindi è sicuramente conveniente. E l'errore che è dato dal termine che è in realtà è piccolo perché l'accoppiamento tra le variabili è veramente poco. Perché tipicamente il problema con il campionamento è che le variabili accoppiate richiedono un sacco di condizioni perché l'accoppiamento tra variabili cresce sostanzialmente di diverso. Se potessi soltanto campionare lungo ogni dimensione in maniera indipendente, quindi se io riesco a eliminare il termine accoppiato, in realtà questa espansione qui è molto più facile. Is there like a some sort of a variable that multiplies the V of my represents some exclusion? I, I can restart from this, okay, I went too yeah. fast and I can even explain it. Okay, uh, let's resume. Okay. Okay, so I was asked to uh, uh, restart from this point because I went a bit fast. Okay, so uh, the idea of the high-dimensional model representation is that um, I can take whatever quantity I'm interested in, could be the final state, could be anything else I'm interested in, and I can decompose basically this function into the sum of functions that are, for example, dependent only on one variable. Okay? So if I stop at this term, what I'm saying is that this function f is the sum only of functions that contain only x or only y or only z. Okay? But I don't know what these functions are because I'm not doing a Taylor expansion. I don't have access to the actual model. So I have to figure out a way to write this and then through sampling, I need to be able to model this function set. Okay? So, say that I take any uh, interpolation function, even one of the, the previous methods, like a, a clicking model. Okay? 
So a Kriegin model <coughs> is based on the fact that I can evaluate my stochastic variable at some point, calculate the response of my model, and then derive these coefficients. Okay? So I can do the same here. But in this case, I assume that each one of these f is, say, a Kriegin, but only with one variable. Okay? So I sample only in one direction. And I calculate the coefficients only for that direction. That approximation might not be good enough because it's similar to expanding <coughs> the Taylor series up to order one. So I say, okay, let's expand to order two, and now I look at the coupling between variables. And again, I have to do the same process. So I have to take a polynomial representation with unknown coefficients for each one of this delta f, sample my function, calculate the coefficients, and see what the shape of that function f is. What is the advantage of this approach? Again, we are talking about a non-intrusive approach, so I don't need to have access to the model. I am not calculating a Taylor expansion by hand, by Mathematica, by Maple. I'm just sampling the, the model I have. So I, I, I run integration all in time. But what happens is that if I decompose this, at some point I should see that some terms, and typically the couple terms, start becoming smaller and smaller. Okay? So what I can, and, and actually you see it, you see that some variables start becoming less and less coupled. So the, the coupling effect of two variables, of two, of two stochastic variables, have a very weak influence on the probability distribution of your quantity of interest. Okay? And that, that is quite important because if you have a high dimensional problem, say that in your dynamics you don't have just the six initial conditions, but you have the six initial conditions plus some model parameters, Already when you are above 10 variables and you try to sample that space and you take, say, even two samples per coordinate, okay, what you have is 2 to the 10, to the 13, to the 20 number of samples that you need to simulate with your model. Okay? So if you go up with the number of dimensions, the cost of uh, building a model representation and you heard some, uh, this morning someone who uh, was explaining they were building a representation of uh, the, the space that really populated. Okay? So uh, if you want to uh, use measurements or samples or simulations to then build a representation of something, you need to deal with the problem of dimensionality. But if your uh, stochastic variables are weakly coupled, okay, so changing two together doesn't really affect much your probability distribution. Then you can discard a, lo a lot of terms in your expansion. And you, you can truncate this expansion and use a reduced number of samples. So this is the idea of, of this approach. Now, <laughs> if we talk about intrusive methods, what I said is one intrusive approach is to use, again, polynomial chaos expansions but in this case, what you do, instead of sampling, if you have access to your differential equation, you can replace your polynomial expansion into the differential equation. And then you try to calculate basically the coefficient of this uh, um, expansion by equating the left-hand side and the right-hand side. It still requires you to uh, deal with the differential equations and uh, do some calculations, but <coughs> if you have access to the model, okay, uh, it removes the problem, for example, of integration or simulation of your, uh, of your system. I, I mentioned before an extension of the state transition matrix to the state transition tensor. And the end result and the goal of, of this approach is very similar to all the previous approaches. What you want is a polynomial representation 
of, for example, your final state. But you don't want to stop at the first statistical moment. You don't just want to add the, the expected uh, value or uh, to the second st statistical moment, which is the variance. You want to add a much more rich representation of <coughs> what the final state can be. So this requires you to uh, solve a number of equations that corresponds basically to the expansion of your dynamics beyond uh, the first term, okay? So beyond the Jacobian. So you have to expand to higher terms and uh, for each one of these higher terms you need to propagate forward in time. Now, if then you have an assumption on the particular distribution of your uncertain variables, like in this case if you introduce the assumption that you have a Gaussian distribution, you can then recover uh, classical quantities like uh, the mean uh, and the variance uh, for, for your current state. <coughs> now this brings me to uh, another way of dealing with intrusive approaches, which is the use of an algebra, as I mentioned before. So the, the history of the use of algebras instead of real numbers Dates back, I think, to uh, 82, when someone introduced this idea of uh, ultra-arithmetic, in which, again, you don't use just crisp numbers. And probably the, the most well-known approach, in this sense, is the one that uh, Bertz proposed in, uh, uh, in the 80s. And in fact, what he did was to propose the use of Taylor differential algebra to uh, study um, um, the, uh, the motion of particles in a particle accelerator. So for that, you have a, a uncertainty model that you want to propagate forward in time, and so it, he decided to replace basically real numbers with polynomial expansion, so, so with polynomials that were describing the region of uncertainty. And more recently, this was applied to orbital mechanics, and to the motion of single spacecraft, the motion of asteroids, the motion of space debris. And for quite a long time, till 2010, everyone worked with pair expansions. And there is, a reason, there is a reason for that. And the reason is that the most intuitive way to think of propagating uncertainty is still to have in mind a most likely point or the uh, expected state of your spacecraft and then expand your dynamics around that expected state because in the end you want to have one particular point. Now coming from another direction what we decided to do was to follow what uh, Yoldis did in a completely different field and she said okay what if we drop Taylor expansions and we have a different representation with other types of polynomials like Chebyshev polynomials and in this case, what you do is to forget about the fact that you have one most likely point around which you're expanding. You simply consider that you have a set and you want to have a representation over the entire set. So you have a, a global representation of your uncertainty over a set. And so we, we expanded this from one-dimensional cases to multi-dimensional cases. And we, we name this generalized polynomial algebra. So the idea again is that uh, you replace basically each uh, variable with a polynomial and each operation, each fundamental algebraic operation is replaced with an operation among polynomials. And every function that you have, sine, cosine, tan, whatever you have, you expand that in polynomial series and then you uh, work with polynomials and instead of uh, crisp numbers. Now, if you look at this again from a classical point of view uh, in dynamics, you have your dynamical system and you want to expand around the point that you know, because that's your initial condition. And then you want to propagate the flow around that expected point. This, this is uh, perfectly fine. And what you can do is to uh, use Taylor to do this expansion, you propagate to the model, and then you get a representation of the final state 
which again is a polynomial. What we did was take this, as I said, from another point of view, and we said, we don't have x0. We don't have x0 because at the end of the day, we don't really know if that x0 is really the most likely event. So what we have instead is what often is called viability in uh, uh, viability theory a level set of possible states. And none of them is necessarily the most likely, or I can have a multi-model distribution, so with multiple peaks here. But I still want to propagate this to the system and get the representation of the final state. This, again, is something that can happen if you, for example, have a very badly characterized sensor that can give you multiple answers about your measurement, okay? <coughs> and the other thing that we did was to say, okay, is the use of an algebra, like using Taylor expansions, more or less expensive than using a, uh, a polynomial chaos expansion? Okay. So another method that is not intrusive, but allows you to uh, uh, run simulations and from these simulations reconstruct your final state. And what we saw is that, of course, if you increase the complexity of your right-hand side of your dynamical system, and you increase the number of dimensions, at some point you have that is better, these are separatrix of when is better to use one or the other. Below, it's better to have an expansion with your algebra. Above, it's better if you sample your system and you then reconstruct the final state. So if you have a very complex right-hand side, calculating an expansion of also entire series with multiple terms and then doing the integration becomes rapidly quite expensive. So it's better to calculate, basically, your propagated state but just integrating the, the system model. Now, let me show you an example. So this is work that we did to study the re-entry of uh, Goche. And what we did was to say, OK, let's take a point that we consider to be the most likely uh, position of Goche during the entry. Then we run a full Monte Carlo simulation. Then we did a Taylor expansion with Taylor differential algebra. And then we use a more global representation with Chebyshev polynomial. So what happens is that, as I said before, if you assume that you have a most likely event, when you expand, at some point, your Taylor expansion diverges because you are outside the convergence radius of your Taylor expansion. If you use a more global representation, again, you drop the hypothesis that you know where Goche is at a particular instant of time, but your Monte Carlo simulation matches much better the, the representation that you have with your algebra. And this was just for fun. We took a cloud of debris with a higher to mass ratio, and we studied the evolution forward in time by using uh, orbital elements instead of Cartesian core. Okay, um, I would propose that I stop here the uncertainty part, okay? Because I see that you are already fried. Uh, <laughs> I am for sure. And also because the, the next part is uh, complicated <laughs> to explain. Um, and I think I, I already gave you a lot of material and tools uh, to use if you want in uh, orbital mechanics. And I switch to the other lecture, so we change also topic. <laughs>